Now, cellular DFs, uh, my mentor, uh, Sharon Weiss, she really liked to reserve the use of the term cellular DF, particularly for dermatofibromas that were big and deep and cellular and had intersecting fascicles. Um, some people will use that term for any DF that's that's large and hypercellular. I feel like there's not a perfect uh, definition in the literature, or at least if there is, I've not come across it. So uh, for what is cellular DF versus just regular DF. But I think the one point that I did learn from Dr. Weiss was that the, the importance of cellular DF is A, they can look scary, particularly when they have intersecting fascicles. People can start thinking that there's some sort of uh, tumor with fibrosarcomatous change, like a fibrosarcomatous DFSP, or, or um, you know, maybe I've seen people confuse them with sarcomas because of the fascicles. Um, um, the, but people get concerned about it being a sarcoma, okay? Uh, because it'll be big, it'll be cellular, it'll have intersecting fascicles, it'll have mitoses. All of those things are concerning to people. And yet these tumors are, are technically benign. There are rare examples of dermatofibroma that can metastasize to different sites, uh, to distant sites, particularly the lungs. But, uh, and it turns out that those very rare cases tend to be cellular DFs or aneurysmal DFs. DFs that are large and deep. But that said, we can't predict which DFs are going to metastasize. And it's so incredibly rare that I personally don't even bring this up at all in my pathology reports, unless there's been a case that metastasizes. I don't tell people, oh, cellular DFs can sometimes metastasize. I think that's overkill. That's going to freak out the patient and the treating physician and going to result in excessive surgery, probably with big margins that's not needed. Um, and uh, also that's like telling every patient with a basal cell carcinoma, well, sometimes basal cell carcinomas metastasize and kill people. Yeah, that's true, but it's pretty rare, right? So same thing in uh, dermatofibromas. So anyway, there's a little tangent there. I was going to not go down that road, but I decided to anyway. Uh, sometimes that happens. So the, the thing about cellular DFs is that they persist or recur more often. And this is a little bit complicated. In the past, people would say it was up to, you know, 50%. Some more recent studies have come out. A, a nice paper just a few years ago by Keith Duffy and colleagues came out and found, I think, that the recurrence rate was about 10%. Uh, it, was, it was much lower. And he had also mentioned at a meeting before, at one of the American Society of Dermpath meetings, that anecdotally, um, if you remove the bulk of a cellular DF, even if the margins are focally positive, usually it will not recur. And so I actually do mention that in, in my reports that, that you know, removing the bulk of the lesion is probably acceptable. I do not think that you need to go do, you know, two centimeter margins or, or, you know, big, you know, extensive surgical excision or Mohs to try to make sure that you have negative margins like you would for a DFSP. I personally think that that's overkill. And I'm not even 100% sold on the idea that you have to excise these completely. I do usually mention that because cellular DFs are usually larger and go deeper in the skin, they tend to persist or recur more often than conventional DFs. And that excision uh, could be considered to reduce that risk. But I, I really leave that up to the treating physician and the patient. So there you go. That's my two cents on that. And I'm sure that there are probably some people in the audience that disagree with that. And I'm okay with that. I, I think that it's not a hard, fast uh, rule on this. And there are differences of opinion. And I, I will say one last thing. I'm sorry again for the tangent, but hopefully you'll forgive it because people ask me about this a lot. And I, I guess I should have just made a slide for it. But uh, the other thing is I feel a lot of the times so-called recurrence, and I'm using air quotes here, of cellular DF is because someone did a shave biopsy and took off the top of a, you know, a three centimeter, you know, uh, dermatofibroma. And so, yeah, if you shave the top of that off, you're just getting the tip of the iceberg. The bulk of the lesion is left down in the dermis. So of course it's going to continue to grow. So that's more like persistence and continued growth rather than recurrence. It's not recurring because a tiny focus was aggressively, actively growing and, and, and grew back, you know, it's just growing because you just took the top off of it. And of course it's going to keep growing. If you do that, you know, you just took the top of the golf ball and the rest of that thing is sitting down in the dermis or, or subcutis. So I think a lot of times the label of recurrence is probably not really accurate. It's probably just persistence of a partially sampled dermatofibroma that people are seeing. All right. And then also cellular DF sometimes can have focal necrosis. And that's a little bit disconcerting when you see that. Uh, but just know that I think it's up to 10% of cellular DFs in, in some studies can have necrosis. I, I feel like that's maybe a bit more common than I actually see it in my practice. But don't be surprised if you see some necrosis in a cellular DF. Here's one that's deeper down. So I find that when a DF is large and deep and has a, a you know a massive Gren zone, like look, there's like a mile or a couple kilometers, I guess, I don't know. There's a kilometer or more of, of uh, 
uninvolved dermis there between the epidermis and the tumor. And I think that the deeper down the top of a DF is, the less and less epidermal induction type changes and epidermal hyperplasia or tabling that you see. So this epidermis is, to my eye, more or less normal, doesn't really have any tabling or any of that, um, that epidermal change that we see over DF. So don't be surprised, particularly if you get one of these DFs that's way, way down. And this one was very large. I think it was like four or five centimeters. And it was quite cellular, although it didn't really have fascicles. It had sheets of cells, very blue and cellular. It had blood-filled spaces filled with blood and foamy histiocytes and hemosiderin. As you get large DFs, you can sometimes even have these big vessels in it, some almost staghorn-like or hemangioperiocytic vessels. Uh, you can see that in large, deep DFs. You can see that also pretty common in dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans to see staghorn uh, vessels similar to the ones you'd see in a solitary fibrous tumor, uh, particularly in fibrous sarcomatous DFSP is really common to see that vas uh, vascular pattern. So um, this particular case I remember well uh, because it was sent in and the outside uh, person, uh, they were concerned because of how cellular it was and they thought that it was going to end up being a sarcoma. And I said, nope, this is just a big, very juicy cellular and aneurysmal dermatofibroma. Here, there, when blood is abundant, so are foam cells and so is hemosiderin. It's kind of a general a rule that those go hand in hand. The other thing I've seen sometimes in dermatofibromas with abundant bleeding and hemorrhage and aneurysmal change is you can sometimes have an accumulation of Langerhan cells within the lesion. And that can uh, can be a little disturbing if you do a stain like S100, you're gonna be like, whoa, blown away by how much S100 is there. But then if you follow that up with a SOX10, all that will disappear and you'll see this is not actually a melanocytic lesion. Those are just uh, a numerous Langerhan cells within the lesion. So, so just keep that uh, in mind that you can sometimes have a colonization with abundant Langerhans cells. And you can solve that either by using SOX instead of S100 if you were, if you were doing an S100 here because you were worried about a, a melanocytic tumor, for example. You could use SOX instead, or you could do a CD1A and show that, yeah, those S100 positive cells, they're just all Langerhans cells. So remember, there's a mixture of cells present in dermatofibroma. The, the, the fibrohistiocytic cell, again, we don't really know what that is, probably because it doesn't really exist, is probably that these tumors are composed of some modified fibroblast or myofibroblast. Um, uh, and there are um, uh, dendritic cells that colonize the, the lesion, histiocytes, and some, some inflammatory cells as well, all in varying proportion. But, but the main cell probably is a fibroblast or myofibroblast, we think. And here's a closer look that lets you see some multinucleated cells, some foam cells, and some hemocytorin. And look at how plump, how chubby those cells are, right? They're big, fat, almost oval to round in this case. They're not always spindled. They can be oval to round in configuration. And there's an example of one with really dramatic uh, aneurysmal change. And just like cellular DFs tend to be larger and deeper, um, and have a bit more of a tendency to persist or recur. The same exact rule, I think, applies to aneurysmal DFs. And I feel like aneurysmal and cellular DF often kind of can coexist in the same lesion. And this one's got nice epidermal hyperplasia and tabling or flattening of the reedy. And it actually has a nice grand zone too. So I guess the rules do work sometimes. So that's a nice example of aneurysmal change in a dermatofibroma.